All right, I invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31, we're going to cover two verses today. Very aggressive. You'll see why it can only get through two. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 21. Jeremiah 31, 21 says, Set up for yourselves road marks, place for your... Place for yourself guidepost. Direct your mind to the highway, the way by which you went. Return, O virgin of Israel. Return to these your cities. How long will you go here and there, O faithless daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A woman will encompass a man. Keep it real this morning. Dangerously transparent. So it's going to come as a shock to many of you. Eliana and I have fights. I know, I know it's impossible to imagine since she is so lovely and so wise, and I am so, well, uh, actually, considering me, it's very easy to understand why we have conflict. One of the areas that is always a danger zone, a potential landmine to step on, one of the topics that has gotten Ileana on the war path with me is when we go on road trips and I need her to read a map and navigate. <laughs> I see. I have some other brothers here with that. I'm driving and I'm trying to get clarity on where we are going. She's reading the map and she's trying to point us in the right direction. On our way back to Canada after our wedding and honeymoon, I thought about this thinking about Mike and his big day, we, we, we were driving back from our honeymoon to Canada and we had a blow up over driving directions. And right then, just like that, in Massachusetts, the honeymoon was over. <laughs> Done. But God has been so good to us. He has bestowed upon us something which saved our marriage. Google Maps. <laughs> Just punch the address into the phone and it tells you which way to go. But even with that, nevertheless, there are still times when we, the three of us, her, me, and the phone, all argue about which way we're to go and what route to take. And why didn't you tell me sooner uh, where that term was going to be? As good as Google Maps is, I want to still read the road signs, Kevin. I still want to know the exit numbers. I want to know, are we going north, south, east, or west? I need to understand the lay of the land. Are we upriver? Are we downriver? Are we on the inner loop? Are we on the outer loop? What are the landmarks? Because just in case, Ileana might be wrong. Probably not, but just in case... And just in case the phone freezes or the data runs out, I want to have some sense. I want to know where we're going. And the reason why I want to know where we're going is because I want to be able to get back home again. See, we have visited New York City and Philadelphia and Boston and Toronto and Montreal. And we've been to Charleston. We've been to Tampa. And we've been over to Nashville. And we really enjoy all of our road trips. But I don't want to stay in any of those places. At the end of that trip, I want to get back home to St. Mary's. And this is the point of Jeremiah 31, 21. He says, set for yourself road marks, place guideposts, direct your mind to the highway by which you went. And he says it twice. He says, return, return. When landowners or woodworkers go out into the woods, they always mark a trail either with a hatchet or maybe with some plastic ribbon markers tying it off on the different trees as they go along the way so that they can figure out how to get back from the way they went in. Because, you know, when you go into the woods, all trees are different looking, but after a while they all look the same, right? And you get in there and next thing you know you're turned around and and uh, you can't find your way back out, but the markers help you find your way back out again. Uh, now, once you've traveled uh, back and forth that trail a few times, then you get to know it, and you don't need the markers anymore. And you get very familiar. Two summers ago, we were in New Brunswick, uh, back where I grew up for summer vacation, and I wanted to take 
take the family to a couple of places they'd never been before, things that I used to do when I was little growing up. Uh, but I hadn't been to these spots in over 30 years. Uh, I wanted to take them to uh, the banks of the St. John River where I used to fir fish for perch. And I also wanted to take them to an old swimming hole all the way back in the woods. Now, the fishing spot, that was very familiar to me. And without hes hesitation, I took them right to the very rocks that I always stood on and fished. And uh, it was just like old times, except for we didn't catch any fish like I used to. But nevertheless, we did find that spot. Now, the swimming hole, that was completely different because, well, this swimming hole, all the locals call it Hell's Eddy. Hell's Eddy. The, the stream is officially called on the map the Becca Gwimmick. It's an Indian term, Becca Gwimmick. And uh, it's typically ankle to knee deep. And it's great for trout fishing. Who are my trout fishers, guys that like that? This is a great stream for that. But this one spot on the Becca Gwimmick is really, really deep. You can't reach the bottom. So the folklore is that it is an opening to hell. So Hell's Eddie sounds really cool, and its depth makes it an amazing swimming hole. But it's trickier for me to remember how to get to Hell's Eddie since I've really only been there like two or three times because my parents never took me as a kid. It's just a fast-moving stream, and it has a lots of rocks, and it is also a, a huge, sudden, deep drop-off into hell. So, you know, it's not a place you take your kids. Also, because it's kind of back in the woods, it was a really cool place for young people to go and drink and party, so it wasn't very family-friendly for the kids. But uh, once I turned 16 and could drive, I could get myself there. But also, you got to remember, it was a hike down into the woods, and uh, you got to be pretty motivated and want to take the, take the walk. And it's also in Canada, which means, you know, there's only two months of the year you could really swim in it anyways. So there's a very short window to go to Hell's Eddy. Uh, my dad told me that uh, this week they had the first snowfall of the year. I said, it's 70 degrees here. And he said, I'm moving down. So uh, <laughs> make room, Ileana. Dad's coming. Now, uh, I wanted to take the boys to this really cool, unique swimming hole that I've only been through a handful of times. And I'm working off of 30-year-old memories, right? So... Uh, drove to where the potato field that I was pretty sure we had to go down. And, you know, that's it, eh? There's no sign on a potato field. It's just a potato field, and then you take this side road. So we go down the side road to the back corner, park the car, and, yep, there's a trail here. This is the trail. Walk down to the woods on this trail, come to a dirt bike trail, and then I'm like, is it right or left? I don't know. I think it's right. Let's try right, you know. And, oh, I can hear the water, so we are in the right vicinity. And then we walk right there for a while, and then, sure enough, I see the, the other trail that leads to the water. I'm thinking, okay, this is it. I know this is the place. And we go down there, and sure enough, we found this great swimming hole, and we had this cool, refreshing swim in July. And afterwards, the boys said to me, I think Robbie said this, actually. He said, you know, Dad, partway down that hill, I was thinking, this is going to be lame. But I was quite shocked that it was actually very cool. And to be honest, I was, I was quite shocked myself. First of all, that we didn't get lost. And second of all, that it was as cool as I remembered. There are places, roads, even paths through the woods back in New Brunswick that 30 years later, I still know them like the back of my hand with or without road marks or guideposts. I can find my way. I don't need any signs to get me through the state of Maine to find Canada. I know how to get there, no problem at all. You can just shut the Google Maps off once I get outside of D.C. Don't need that anymore, how to get back to St. Mary's and get back home. I know all the roads, the highways to take. Um, the children of Israel have, taken, have been taken far and away. They have been scattered to the remote parts of the earth. Uh, Jeremiah 31 verse 8 says, I am bringing you out of the north country. I'm gathering them back from the remote part of the earth. So God has promised that he is going to pull these people who are scattered. He's prophesied that he's going to bring them back home. And he wants them to remember the way back. He wants them to have trail markers, guideposts, direct their minds to the highways, you know, uh, there's, there's, some back, there's some back communities 
some uh, side streets in St. Mary's County, even if you're familiar with this county, you can still get back in there and get turned around like, oh, which way do I go on these little side roads? But once you get to the 235, you know where you are, right? And everyone knows, oh, yeah, we need to go this way or that way. Once you get to the highway, it's no problem. And God says, find the highway. Return, virgin Israel. Return to these your cities. Now, the title virgin Israel is telling of who is going to return. See, it's not harlot Israel. It's not Israel who went whoring after other gods. It's virgin Israel. Meaning a people who have kept themselves pure. They have not defiled themselves worshiping false gods. They are a people who are waiting patiently and dutifully for their one true love. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who promised to make them a great nation. Promised them land and blessings in the earth. The harlot nation were unfaithful to God, so they were driven out of the land, but a generation would rise up who would be virgin, would be committed to waiting for the promises of God, and that is the people who will find their way back. And it took quite some time for this prophecy to come true, because this people were driven out in 586 BC and returned 70 years later, but they never were a free people, right? They were always a vassal state or an occupied people until 70 AD when they were completely scattered again, completely scattered to never enter the nation of Israel and that land ever again. But what happened is it all changed and Jeremiah chapter 31, 21 became fulfilled prophecy in some of your all's lifetimes in 1948. Israel became a nation again in one day. God foretold a long time ago that he would bring his scattered people out from the nations and would declare them a nation in a single day. Isaiah 66 verse 8 says, Who has seen or heard of anything as strange as this? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a mere moment? But by the time Jer Jerusalem's birth pains began, a baby will be born, a nation will come forth. Would I ever bring this nation to a point of birth and not deliver it? Ask the Lord. No, I would never keep this nation from being born, says the Lord. And this is exactly what happened in May 14th. 1948, having been brought to the brink of extinction through the horrors of the Holocaust, facing the persecution around the world, surrounded by their enemies, the Jewish people gathered together in Israel and declared themselves a nation in a single day. And the United States of America recognized Israel as a nation on that same day, and Israel's victories in the wars since have solidified their place among the nations of the world. If anyone ever questions the authenticity, the dependability of Scripture, our faith is rooted in proven scientific facts of archaeology, geography, world history, and hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of predictive prophecies that have come true. We have all the evidence to back our faith. It's just that people are one of two things. They are either uninformed... They never heard this history lesson before, or they are willfully ignorant. We are working every week to help the uninformed, to give you the lessons of history, to give you the contents, the prophecies, the facts of Scripture, but there's not a lot we can do for people who are willfully ignorant. But I have seen one dynamic that seems to effectively inspire the willfully ignorant to change their mind, and that is, of course, pain right? Pain works great to make people open the eyes of their hearts. It worked for Israel, like we observed last week. The chastening of the Lord brings the wayward nation back in line, and now we see that they're finding their way back home. How long will you go here and there, O faithless daughter? Verse 22 says, the virgin faithful daughter can find the highway back home. The faithless daughter is wandering here and there and lost. But it seems like she doesn't need to be. It seems like the question, how long, indicates that the delay is unnecessary. The homelessness, the wandering, the lostness can be over at any time. All you have to do is follow the guidepost back home. 
I wonder what the guideposts are. What are the highways that he is talking about here? Well, Isaiah 35 says, a highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean, they're not going to travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way and fools will wander on it. The highway of holiness, to be like God, knowing good from evil and righteousness from corruption. The psalmist says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The psalm says in Psalm 32, verse number 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you will go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. So the way, the path, the path of holiness, which the word of God reveals to us is Scripture, right? 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, that's our teaching, for reproof, correcting, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, may be equipped for every good work. So the guideposts leading one on the path of righteousness, the, the path of God is his law. It's his word. It's his Scriptures, right? These are all different titles we give to this, which is the, what is this? The Bible, right? The Bible, which is why we come to a Bible church, right? That's why we come here to begin with. Coming to church does not make us holy, but what is being taught, if it is the Word of God, this lights our path. And if we follow it, we come out of darkness, come out of lostness, come out of faithlessness, and we can return to the God who created us. Verse 22. For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A, a woman will encompass a man. And you read that and you wondered, what does that mean? Right? And I thought the same thing. I read that and I said, what does that mean? I don't know. So maybe I better check the scholars. Charles Feinberg writes in his most reliable and my favorite commentary on the book of Jeremiah, he says about verse 22, and I quote, the second half of this verse is one of the most disputed in the entire book. That does not sound good. Many scholars admit that a satisfactory solution is not attainable. No interpretation has been accepted by the majority of scholars, which means there's no quick answer. And Daniel, now I got to do my own word study on this. <sighs> which I did, and I think I came up with a pretty amazing interpretation. But let me just say this before I give you my interpretation and then the application. This could be right or this could be wrong. We cannot be dogmatic about this interpretation. Why not, Pastor Rob? Well, because the author himself, who knows what the real meaning is, does not elaborate. And nowhere else in his writings does he tell us what this phrase means. And that is our first rule of interpretation. Scripture interprets Scripture, right? When you want to know what the author means by this, you try to find where he says it somewhere else, and you let Scripture interpret Scripture. So I went looking for what else he says about this, and uh, unfortunately, he didn't say anything else about it. So now... I have to break the phrase down and deal with how the words themselves are used in other passages, right? Okay, so let's do this. Uh, the Lord has created a new thing in the earth, okay? A new thing, that's very easy to understand. Uh, the Hebrew word means something fresh, not seen before. Okay, got that part, no problem. What's the new thing? A woman will encompass a man. Well, we know what a woman is, right? Most of us know what a woman is. Most of us know what a man is, right? We don't really need to delve into that. That's pretty clear. The word that really describes the new thing is the action of the woman encompassing the man. What does that mean? In what sense does a woman encompass a man? Right? A bunch of women standing around a man. How's that a new thing? Right? I saw Garrett at the, at the dance last night. There was girls around him, you know. But that's nothing new, Garrett, right? You're used to having gr cute girls around you all the time, right? That's, that's not new. It's been going on for a long time, just for Garrett, but, you know, for, for guys. 
How, how is a woman encompassing a man? Is it, is it arms of embracing? Is, is it hugs? Well, that's a, that's a very loving thought, but that's not new, right? Everybody gets, gets love and hugs from their mamas. This, this Hebrew word here, savav, it, which means surround. So how and when is this word typically used in other passages since Jeremiah does not elaborate on how a woman surrounding a man is a new thing? Well, in some passages, encompass is just basically used to describe water surrounding something. So in those instances, it's just a stated fact, water surrounding, you know, that's not, not really a, any real insights that I can glean from that. But then there are other times when the word encompass, surround, is used and there is a very specific purpose for the encompassing. The purpose of the encompassing, I think, is the clue to interpreting this passage. So we see in Joshua chapter 6, the word is used in this uh, narrative where it says, you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once, and you shall do this for six days. Now in the context uh, uh, here, the nation of Israel is marching around the city of Jericho because they are attacking, right? And they did this for six days, and that's a great way to attack a city. If it's fortified, it's got walls, you encircle it, you cut off their supplies, you starve them out, and then you break the wall down. Except for in Joshua's case, they didn't have to starve anybody out because they just walked around it for six days, and then they just blew some horns and shouted, and God knocked the walls down. And that's a great story in the book of Joshua. But we see here, it's used in this concept, uh, this context of a battle. And then we see it in 2 Samuel chapter 5, again, when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go directly up, but circle around behind them and come to them in front of the balsam trees. And in this story, we see, we, we, God tells David to flank the Philistines, to surround them in battle and defeat them. And that's a great military maneuver, isn't it? Who go, instead of just head on, to sneak around the backside and get them from the back where they're not expecting the attack. So we see it in that context. And then also in 2 Kings Verse 11, it says, when you shall surround the king, each with a weapon in hand, whoever comes within the ranks, whoever comes up to your ranks, you'll kill him, right? You'll put him to death and with, with the king and be with the king where he goes in and when he comes out. So what's happening in that, in that context? Is that, is that offensive? No, there's a circle of people around the king to what? To protect and to defend him, but it still is being used in the sense of Warfare, isn't it, right? So defense is also part of warfare. Um, David uses it in a similar context again in, in Psalms 32, two times in this chapter. He says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. He's talking about defense. You surround me. You have songs of deliverance. This is, this is hiding me. This is protecting me. And then again in verse number 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. So God is surrounding and protecting in Psalms 32. And then David uses this Hebrew word again in Psalms 49, verse number 5, where he says, Why should I fear in the day of adversity when the iniquity of my foes surrounds me? So again, it's a surrounding attack that's happening. So, in all of these passages, the word surround, the word compass, is used in the context of attacking or defending, attacking or defending, but in both of those it's still warfare. So observing that, we come back to Jeremiah 31 and add that usage to the meaning of the word. A woman is surrounding to attack or surrounding to defend a man. God will do a new thing. A woman will surround to attack or surround to defend. Is that a new concept? Is that a new thing? Women being a part of the military? And the answer is yes. Women participating in battle is a new thing because it was always the men that would go out to the war and the women that would stay back and provide for the children. If there was an attack on the city, it was the men that would go to the walls to defend the city. Women surrounding men in a military offensive maneuver or a military defensive maneuver, this is a new thing. Would you be interested to know 
that most Israeli citizens are required to serve in the Israel Defense Forces for a period of two to three years. Israel is unique in that military service is compulsory for both males and females. It's the only country in the world that maintains an obligatory military service for women. Women have to serve in the military of Israel. Now, there are exceptions for maybe women who are married or women who are pregnant or some other reasons. Uh, there's exceptions. They don't have to. But these are exceptions to the rule. Actually, 65% of all Israeli women have military experience. Now, nobody else in the world does that. No other time in history has that happened. For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A woman will encompass a man. So my interpretation of this passage is modern day Israel's obligatory military service for women is a fulfillment of Jeremiah 31's prophecy. Once again revealing to us that God's word comes true. When God says something, it will happen. Wow. Women on the warpath. Now, just by show of hands, how many women, how many ladies do we have here who have served in the military? How many ladies have served in the military? See, we too have that same thing when we thank you for your service to defend our country. Now, we have another battle that women enter into as well. We have literal physical wars, but Paul also tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6 Picking it up in verse number 10, he, he commands, Paul be, commands, Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And have everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace in addition to all taking the shield of faith that with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition prayer at all times, in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and all petition for who? All the saints. And pray, Paul says, pray on my behalf. We have women who do a type of intense spiritual battle every day. Women who put on the armor of God and stand and fight, fight for their homes and their families, fight for their churches and the souls of lost men and women, boys and girls. And the battle they fight so effectively, these women fight so effectively with the weapon because they have an amazing skill to pray. The women of warfare encompass us. They surround us with their prayers, with their prayers of deliverance, prayers for protection, prayers of intercession and supplication. You know, I have had three different ladies tell me in the last two weeks that they're praying for me specifically. Two of our senior ladies told me that they, has been impressed upon them just in recent weeks to pray for me. And one said, I had such strong conviction in the middle of the night, God woke me up to pray for you. And I just got to say, praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Because there's a special kind of power when the women enter the spiritual battlefield with prayer. Especially our senior ladies. You want to know why? Because those gals do it for hours. My mother-in-law is here. You'll appreciate this one. Abuelita, your mom, Eliana's grandmother, and you can testify to this, would get up every morning and start warring 
for this family. And she would pray for hours. Every morning she would go on the war path encompassing us with prayer, surrounding us with petitions, with giving of thanks and supplications. 93 years old and she was a warrior and she died in the trenches fighting for her family. And when she passed away, I said to Eliana, I said, who in this family will be as devoted to pray for us like that? Hours, think about that, hours every day. I think these senior ladies do this so much that they, they are able to just crack open a direct line to the throne room of God, a path that the enemy just can't cut off. You know, a lot of you know I got this dopey phone that if I'm talking to you, you know, partway through our conversation, it's just going to go dead, right? And you're like, oh, well, there goes Rob's phone. It always does this. There's a spot between Callaway and Piney Point where it's just dead and nothing goes through there. Uh, the calls get dropped. The enemy likes us to drop our calls, doesn't he? He likes to get us distracted with things to do and places to go and even the kids and all the busyness of life to disrupt our prayer times. But it seems like these senior gals, so often they are just so disciplined that they don't let that prayer time get affected. Either that or they just, they're just up late at night and they just pray because there's nobody else awake and they just stay up and they pray and they, they, they say, Lord, bring down your protection upon my home, upon my children, upon my grandchildren, on our church, on our pastor. Lord, in the name of Jesus, set to flight the spirit of confusion and discouragement and the lies of the enemy. And Lord, bring your peace and hope and your love and revive us and lead us in the path of righteousness. And they stay on the line and they beg and they cry. Did you hear what I said? They cry for us. Now, I don't know about this personally. I can only tell you what I've noticed with some of my, my buddies. There's something about a little girl pleading with daddy. There's something about a, a daughter saying, daddy, please, I need your help. A sad look, a little tear, and I see these guys get up and they're ready to do whatever baby girl wants. She's going to get it. Right? Dad's like, yep. You women of, on the war path, you are daughters of the King of Kings. Unleash the power of your tears. If us fathers, earthly fathers, would rise up and be attentive to our little daughter's tearful request, how much more your heavenly Father will rise up for you? Can you visualize this church and all of the women here as a powerful army, women, of warfare, encompassing and surrounding, resisting the devil and him fleeing. Can you imagine a demon running from a 90-year-old woman? Yes, absolutely, absolutely terrified because not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. So God raised up some warriors for me in the last couple of weeks. Raise them up for our church. Raise them up to assault the powers of darkness. Ladies, we need all of you, though. We need you to encompass us with your prayers, to surround us with your blessings. God is doing a new thing through you. A new thing. See, you got to remember in the Old Testament, it was only the high priest that could go into God's presence. It was only the high priest that could get into the Holy of Holies. But you, through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have a position given to you as daughters, as daughters of the Most High King. You can boldly walk into the throne room of God and you can make your request and you can shed a little tear and your Heavenly Father delights to hear from you and wipe that tear and grant your requests. May you hear these words today, and may God do a new thing in your walk of faith, a new thing in your family and our church and in this region. May God stir you up to go on the warpath with the weapon of prayer, encompassing us in defense and surrounding the enemy and thwarting and stifling his evil plans with songs of deliverance. Cries of victory and shouts of praise breaking. And I want you to pray for this. I want you to pray that he will break the stronghold of fornication over our men and our families. Because we got this conference coming up in March dealing specifically with overcoming pornography and sexual addiction. 
It's a stronghold in many people's lives. And the stats are that over 70% of men in church are struggling with pornography. Could you assault that stronghold for us? Pray for your men that this would result in revival and deliverance and victory in our church. Pray for us, the men, that we would grow to be spiritual leaders in our homes. And just, I know you're praying for the kids, so keep praying for that. And keep praying for the church. And keep praying for that. And you know what? Just pray for everything. Just pray for, we all need it. Pray for everything. And do not grow weary. Do not grow weary in the battle. Please, just keep encompassing us with your prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just now, Holy Spirit, inspire this powerful force, your daughters, Jesus, your sisters, who would rise up and do this new thing. And through this new thing, we would see new life, we would see revival in your people, and we would see new birth in men and women, boys and girls, who need to trust in Jesus, that it would start with these prayers. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.